Okay. Um, happy Wednesday evening. I appreciate all of you joining today. I know that we had a bit of a uh, change of the schedules as on Monday, unfortunately, I had another commitment assigned by the uh, president of the college where I had to attend to. So I really do appreciate you joining me today. Um, as we are getting started, uh, I'm just going to share my plan for today. I want to take a little bit of time for us to go through the uh, chapter material, even though you have the videos and some other independent material to loop through the what we're looking on these two chapters actually today, chapters seven and eight, uh, even though we had the material for that on the blackboard, I feel it's important that I take a little bit of time to go through it with you also on this live online session. So I'm dedicating part of the class today for that. But another part, absolutely, good question. <laughs> so the other part that I want to spend time is on actually having a look of the lab. Because as you'll see when you kind of start to work your way through the lab, is that that lab was initially designed. And I'm not going to beat around it. I'm going to be very honest. It was designed for us being in a classroom together or in a lab together. Uh, so moving it during the pandemic to this virtual setting, uh, I think it remains a rather theoretical. So I want us to at least have a chance to discuss through it. So you don't have to just sit there and try to figure out what is the theory behind and what are we trying to go uh, and get out of the lab. One thing that I hope that you will see from both the lecture and the lab is that those two are connected. So we're kind of trying to take some of the themes that we've covered in the lab or in the lecture material and move it to the lab setting. Uh, so that's the plan for today. Before I jump into either one of these, I do want to give a little bit of time in case anyone has any questions, uh, just so that we can go through those. I anticipate that one of the questions is the quiz due tomorrow. Uh, I would say, and I'll have to go and have a look, but I would say that it's due on the day when we normally have all the material due. Let me just pull it up because um, I teach a few different sections. I'm going to give you the right answer. Just bear with me. I'm just pulling up the schedule. And I see what you're asking. Uh, I think what I can do, and I feel quite comfortable doing that, is to move the due date of the quiz to the October 23rd, which is the Saturday. So you have a little bit of time to kind of digest through the material that we have uh, looked today. I think that that's only fair. So if you bear with me, uh, I'm going to do it right now just so that I don't forget to do it. So both lab and quiz would be due on Saturday of this week. Uh, so it, it gives you a little bit of time to kind of uh, work your way through it. And if any questions come up, anything, uh, it, it gives you time to also revisit those. So I've updated the due date for the quiz. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Please always let me know what I can do. To, I'm not here to catch you out. Uh, so let me know what I can do to help. But do we have any questions other than, uh, yes, we will go through the lab and the quiz is due on the same day as the lab is, which is Saturdays of this week. I'm going to be honest. I think most of my courses have been set up in a way that I still accept work, even though the due date has gone. Uh, but there might be a great penalty or so on. Any other questions? 
Well, what I'd like to do, just because I do have some questions that we'll use to kind of visit and do checkpoints of the material, but I would ask you to post your name on the chat at this point so I can take the attendance right at the beginning of the class and then we can take it in a few other times. I really appreciate you doing that. That just makes it easier so that I'm not uh, forgetting to do it or if someone has to leave early or so on. I am going to try to keep this session to about an hour uh, just simply because I have another class I'm due to teach. Uh, I know it's going to be quite a bit of material to cover in an hour. So if at any stage I'm going through material too fast, and you get confused, let me know. Oh, and one more thing, I think that I was thinking of saying this and I don't think I verbalized it. One thing that you will see on your uh, schedule, if you look for this week, I might have written there that you would be looking at chapter nine independently. I have a feeling that I did do that. Let me just pull up the schedule once more. There is one chapter that I'm asking you to have a look of independently. And all that it means is that you, yeah, so I've asked that for chapter nine about communication of the cells to sell, that you have a look of that. There is no homework for it. It's just a chapter that I think is a chapter that we do not need to dedicate quite the same time on this course. So it's good to know, but you will not be tested on it. But I don't want to say, that, oh, we never look at that chapter. I'm just leaving it for yourself to uh, kind of determine how much into detail you want to go about that. So having said all that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the material as it relates to the photosynthesis, which was chapter eight, and then cellular respiration, which is actually going to be chapter seven. So we're kind of mixing those up. But I do think based on years and years of teaching this topic, that it makes sense first to talk about photosynthesis and then about cellular respiration. They're kind of events that are connected to each other. And I think that this order, at least uh, based on my experience, is a little bit more clear. Uh, the amount of material on both of these chapters isn't huge, and we're going to keep it fairly uh, general. So at any stage, if I am explaining something that makes absolutely no sense, please, please, please let me know. And I'm trying to move just things around the screen if you're wondering what I'm clicking around. And at any stage, if you have any questions, just unmute yourself, shout out. You can also post to the chat. I'm going to give a warning that I don't always see the chat. So if there's a question and I don't answer it, it's not because I'm ignoring you. Uh, so then just maybe unmute and say that, please check the chat. So let's talk a little bit about photosynthesis. And I believe that this is something that you will have seen being covered in your high school classes or other classes. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. And oh, let me just see. I don't know why I have the pointer going around there. So photosynthesis as a term comes from, oh, I'm jumping all over the place. Let's try again. So the photosynthesis as a term comes from Latin and Greek. And uh, the term pose refers to the light and synthesis putting together. So we're really putting together by something by the help of the light. So the solar energy is what we're focusing here. And as we remember when we discussed back in the day about the uh, how energy travels through our ecosystem, one of the things that we saw that energy never appears out of the blue and it never disappears out of the blue. So all energy started from the sun, but it has to, if we're changing the uh, form of energy to one to another, it has to have an origin and it just cannot disappear. Of course, with every chains of the energy form into another, we lost some energy. And typically, that lost energy is in form of a heat. But there are other ways of losing energy as well. So we animals 
are not capable of doing photosynthesis, you would have to be a plant that has chloroplasts to be able to do photosynthesis. So we had a look of the plant cells uh, a little bit back in the day. So we're kind of circling back to that topic. And we'll talk about chloroplasts in a little more detail on today's session. So some of the photosynthetic organisms that we ha have include many plants, pretty much all plants, algae, and also certain bacteria. Not all bacteria, but certain bacteria are able to do photosynthesis. And there are a bunch of factors that affect the rate of the photosynthesis, uh, but for plants, for algae, uh, to survive, they do need to be able to do photosynthesis. So just kind of as a review, let's have a look what needs to go in to the photosynthesis reaction as reactants. We need to have water and we need to have solar energy. And conveniently, the process of photosynthesis can also bind carbon dioxide. Well, if you have a plant on your tabletop or by the window or even outside, you know that the two things that every plant requires to survive is water and some sunlight. The carbon dioxide is a convenient side, pro uh, side part of this story for us because one of the challenges that we humans and other animals face is that we produce constantly carbon dioxide. Also many other things that we do, uh, motor engines and so on, end up releasing carbon dioxide to our atmosphere. And we talk about the challenge of uh, releasing the carbon dioxide when we consider the greenhouse effect. Uh, and it has been shown that the greenhouse effect uh, is due to the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So one of the things that we can do is to have more plants to bind at least some of that carbon dioxide. And that's why also loose of significant amounts of plants is a problem because we no longer have that ability to bind the same amount of carbon dioxide that we normally would. Uh, for example, uh, majority, big majority of the uh, Earth's plants are located in um, our tropical rainforests. And we are cutting down as a mankind uh, rainforests at the faster rate than ever before. So if we lose these so-called green lungs of the earth, we are probably contributing to the speeding up of the greenhouse effect. So knowing that we need the water and solar energy, basics that every plant needs, just in different amounts. Of course, here in desert, we get plants that don't need as great amounts of water, but some water anyways. And some plants can handle more solar energy, sun, sunlight than others. Some require direct light, some require uh, indirect solar energy. But that goes into this reaction. Well, photosynthesis takes place in the plants, in chloroplasts, like I mentioned, and we'll have a look of the chloroplasts in a second. And what we accomplish with photosynthesis is really making sugars. So making sugars becomes so important. And what I've written here out is a chemical formula for a glucose molecule. Don't worry about the pointer. It's a recording from the past that's came, come to haunt us. So we're making sugars as a result of photosynthesis. Sugars are simply a way of storing energy. And we're storing this energy now in a chemical form. This chemical form of sugars can be then converted to another form of energy uh, as needed. But it's a really good way of storing the energy from the sunlight. So sunlight is not going to be available for us 24-7 in certain areas such as we way at the north, at the past the Arctic Circle where I'm from. We don't get any sunlight for 
for a few weeks of the year, not even a blink. So we do need still that energy available that the solar energy has and how we've been storing it traditionally, how plants, how animals have been in, is in some kind of a chemical composition, such as sugars. The other convenient byproduct of this process of converting solar energy into sugars is that we also produce oxygen. And obviously, we as humans being animals, we need a constant supply of oxygen for us to survive. So very basic concepts that I'm sure that you have seen in the past uh, in your high school classes and so on. But I think that these are really crucial concepts for us to start make sense of uh, a little bit more advanced college level material. So that's why I wanted to take the time to go through those. And of course, what you see is that we can write this reaction in a chemical shorthand as the formula that we have here at the top. Uh, I have not balanced this equation. So I have not counted how many molecules of water do we need to produce that many molecules of glucose. I will balance it in a moment. I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible in that formula on the top of the screen for now. So let's talk a little bit about the workhorse that we have for the production of sugars in the process of photosynthesis. So what we can see is that uh, plants that are able to do photosynthesis have these chloroplasts. So only plants, algae, and certain bacteria have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contribute to this green color that we typically see on many plants. And if we have a plant that has gotten all of the chloroplasts removed from it. What we end up seeing, for example, here on the picture of the leaf is just the skeleton of the leaf, just all the other material, but the material that's able to do photosynthesis. So this leaf no longer is alive. It's no longer able to convert solar energy and water into sugars. So we just have kind of the casing of it all left. The uh, useful part that does the photosynthesis uh, has been uh, removed. So looking at the cell organelle of a chloroplast, uh, that should be a little bit of familiar, a little bit familiar to you from the past, from what we have been discussing when we looked at the cell organelles. We didn't go into great details, but uh, this is the time when we're going to at least review some of the key structures. And these key structures, remember again, your notes are always available to you, both in quizzes and in the exam. So uh, these key structures would be fair game in the quiz or fair game in the exam to be asked. So chloroplasts only found on plants. And a couple of structures that I want to highlight, I want to show that the chloroplast has this double membrane structure that we've talked about in other uh, organelles, cell organelles as well. So we have the outer and we have the inner membrane of the chloroplast. Inside uh, the chloroplast is filmed with, filled with this aqueous fluid called stroma. And within the stroma, we have thylakoids. Thylakoids are these sacs where the photosynthesis really happens. And when we have a pile of thylakoids, they form a granulum. Uh, and really the chlorophyll pigment, the pigment that makes this, uh, gives us this green color, but where also the uh, photosynthesis happens is located inside of these thylakoids. Well, your textbook goes into quite a bit of a detail discussing light dependent reactions. So what of these reactions in the um, in our chloroplasts happen uh, it as, are deemed as light dependent? And also the other aspect, which is known as the Calvin cycle. Uh, 
As long as you know that those two exist, I will not be expecting you to go into detail about either one of these at this time. So now that we have talked about the photosynthesis in general, and we have talked about the chloroplasts, one more thing that ties into this, and I think that we need to take a little bit of time to talk about, is of course the concept of solar energy. So let's have a look of that a little bit. And really the solar energy is nothing but electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic radiation covers everything. It covers everything from X-rays, UV rays, visible light, to radio waves. And of course, we have found many ways to use electromagnetic radiation beyond just the wavelengths that form the visible light. So our interest on this chat that we're going to do is going to be on the visible light. But just remember that the solar energy contains an array of other kinds of electromagnetic radiation that we can utilize, but uh, that's not quite as important for us in this concept when we're talking about photosynthesis. One of the things when we talk about the visible light that I want to draw our attention is that visible light is, of course, made of different wavelengths, different colors, and not all of them are alike in their physical properties. Some of the terms that we need to talk about are shown up here. So uh, this electromagnetic radiation proceeds as waves. And when we look at these waves, we have the crest, the very peak, and true at the, the very bottom of this wave. And if we measure the length from one peak of the wave, to another, we get a distance that gives us the wavelength of that particular electromagnetic wave type. And if we look at different colors, what we'll notice is that the red colors have the longest wavelength out of all the colors that we see, whereas violet has the shortest wavelength out of all the colors that we see. In between, we find all other colors of the prism. So moving from the longest wavelength, from red to orange, to yellow, to green, to blue, to indigo, to violet, and everything in between. And I think that in the quiz, if I remember correctly, and certainly in the exam, I might have a question about testing that are you able to put the different uh, wavelengths within the visible light in order. So I would expect you to know that the red has the longest wavelength. So the distance from this one peak to another, whereas violet has the shortest of the uh, wavelength of the colors that we can see as visible light. I hope that that makes sense. Uh, if you have any questions about that, I would be very happy to entertain those. Kind of to wrap up the uh, discussion on the photosynthesis, we of course want to know that the solar energy, the visible light, is not evenly spread throughout all places where the photosynthesis happens. So one of the things that we often see is that at the higher elevations of the forest, we have plants that receive more solar energy, whereas at the lower levels of the forest, the plants receive less solar energy. So these plants have adapted to a different, different amount of solar energy that they will receive. But as long as there's green color, and as long as these plants are alive, they are most likely photosynthetic plants. They are most likely doing some photosynthesis. As a, and as a result of that process, they are making sugars. So they're storing the solar energy in a chemical format as a sugar. So that brings us back to this formula that we saw. And this formula really is the summary, if I had to pick something that really summarizes this chapter uh, on photosynthesis. So remember, in photosynthesis, we take the sun energy from the sun. 
We also need water and carbon dioxide for the plants, and that all gets converted into sugars. And as a byproduct, we also produce uh, oxygen. So that's what happens in photosynthesis. That's why chloroplasts were important structures uh, from the plant cells that we wanted to know. And remember that they were only present on the plant cells. So that was our first chapter for this week. And you might be wondering, well, OK, that's all very good. Why did we talk about cellular respiration as well? And I'm just going to introduce us to cellular respiration, and then we'll take a second to tackle any questions that you have. So cellular respiration is what all cells do, both plant and animal cells. So we do end up finding mitochondria on both animal and plant cells. And really what cellular respiration is, it's almost like taking the chemical reaction of the photosynthesis and putting it in reverse. So all living organisms require source of energy, so sugars. We also require oxygen, so that's why we need to breathe. That's why we need to do respiration. And respiration is not really just carrying air into your lungs. That air gets carried, the oxygen, to all cells of your body. So the respiration is happening really on a cellular level. That's an important point to notice, that every single cell, without a few exceptions, needs to get access to oxygen and energy, which is usually in form of a sugar uh, in, in this example of cellular respiration. Well, what happens in a mitochondria is that mitochondria converts these sugars and oxygen into ATP. And we have talked about ATP in the past, and I think that what we concluded about ATP was that that was the chemical or cellular energy currency. So how cells navigate and use energy in their functions. So ATP is that what we can use really to drive everything that happens in a cell. So ATP just doesn't appear out of the blue. We take sugars and convert them into ATP. What happens in this reaction of making ATP that we also produce carbon dioxide and some water as a byproduct. So we will need to get rid of that carbon dioxide from the cells. Typically, that gets picked up by our cardiovascular system, transported in the blood to the, in the, blood, to the lung, and then we breathe it out as we do respiration. The water, there's a little bit of a different way of getting rid of that water. There's many uh, methods, but typically we are left with these hydrogen ions and we end up urinating them away. But that's not something that I'm expecting you to know at this point, uh, how to get rid of these. That's more of for the bio 201 and bio 202 classes. But what I'm expecting you to know is how photosynthesis works in converting solar energy into sugars. And we'll talk a little bit more about cellular respiration, but at this point, you should have an idea that in cellular respiration, which happens at the level of mitochondria, we take those sugars and convert them into ATP. So having discussed all that, at this point, do we have any questions about anything that we have discussed? I know that it's quite a lot. And one of the challenges with these classes when we're doing introductory biology is that to really understand everything, we need to go into way more of a depth. But to go into way more of a depth, we would need more than just one semester with this number of meetings. So I'm trying to keep it general. While at the same time, I'm trying to give you enough that you can have an idea of what's happening without expecting that we're going to start to do university level classes. So if anything feels unclear, it's probably not because you are just not getting it. It's probably because we have left a part of the story unaddressed. So that's why I want to give a moment if anyone has any questions about anything that we have discussed so far?
And what I'm going to do, if I don't see any questions coming through, please remember you can shout out, post them on the chat at any time. But I'm simply going to continue our journey. And we're going to jump to chapter seven and discuss the cellular respiration in a little bit more detail. And the reason why I'm moving on and not really taking too much more of a time is that I want us to have the time to all look at the lab today. So let's discuss about cellular respiration a little bit more. I know that I just kind of highlighted some of the key points of it, but there's a little bit more to the story that I want us to discuss. But this will work as a good revision for us. So all cells that we have in the body, there's two things that they require. They require supply of oxygen and they require supply of energy. And the energy was typically supplied as these sugars, as we saw. And what cellular respiration does, so cellular respiration takes place at the level of mitochondria, and we produce this ATP, which is the molecule that we became familiar a little bit earlier on this course. But in order to produce ATP, we need to also, we are left with some waste products that we need to eliminate. So we are left with carbon dioxide and we are left. So those are the things that we kind of, as a trade-off of doing all of, we're left and we need to deal with. Do we have any questions so far? I think I'm just hearing my own echo, so that's why I was checking. So what we should talk about, we should talk a little bit about the mitochondria as this organism, a cell organism, where the cellular respiration takes place. Uh, for the longest of time, we described mitochondria as a cellular powerhouse, or to put it a little bit more simplified, like the power plant of the cell or so on. The idea behind this description was that we thought that ATP is only produced in the cell at the mitochondria. Well, it turns out that this statement is not quite so correct. And this is what I really love about science and teaching sciences. We have been teaching for years and years, tens of years, that this is the fact. But new research is now showing that ATP does get produced elsewhere in the cell than just in mitochondria. However, the majority of the ATP is produced in mitochondria. So we were right when we were saying that that's important, but we were probably using a little bit of a wrong word when we were saying that all ATP is always produced in mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria is an interesting cell organelle for many reasons. Um, mitochondria has its own DNA. And this DNA is actually inherited from your mother completely as 100% in the, the DNA that we find in the mitochondria. Other thing that we see, you often saw that the DNA was kind of this, um, this double helix structure that we saw in typical cell or in the rest of the cell, in the nucleus and so on. Well, it turns out that DNA is not in this structure in the mitochondria. Instead, the DNA that we find in the mitochondria is circular. And you might wonder that, why do I care? Why does that make a difference? Well, just as if you would have a string of a cord uh, of a fabric, eventually it will start over time unbundling from both ends. Well, similar degeneration of the DNA happens over time, over poor conditions. If we're doing forensic work, we're studying archaeological objects, the DNA gets damaged from the ends, moving a little bit onwards and onwards and onwards. But the circular structure of the DNA is much better protected from degeneration. So a lot of the time in my work that I've done with historical objects, historical human remains, or 
forensic work on human remains, uh, what we end up finding that if we are not able to extract DNA from the body as such, we might be able to extract mitochondrial DNA because with it being circular in shape, it is much better protected. It doesn't really have that. If you want to use that analog, it doesn't have that loose end where to start to debundle. Of course, the side effect of using uh, mitochondrial DNA for determining someone's identity or family relationships and so on is that we're only getting the maternal DNA. We're not getting the father's contribution to that individual's DNA. So that's something to keep in mind uh, as we're studying. Uh, let's look at the mitochondria a little bit, what we're seeing here again this double membrane structure that we're seeing uh, filled with matrix. But one of the things that I want to show you that we notice that the mitochondria has, it has a lot of these folds on this inner membrane on the inside of the mitochondria. And it is within these folds, which are known as cristae, it is within these folds where a lot of these reactions that take part that, that are crucial for the cellular respiration take place. So again, if we go to the very, very, very basics of this course, when we thought about cells and all these membranes, how can you get more surface area? Well, one way was to do these folds. So similarly, we're doing these folds inside the mitochondria to have as much area for these reactions to take place. So I hope that that makes sense and that kind of ties in to things that we have been talking about before. And what I have here on the screen is actually a formula for cellular respiration, what happens in cellular respiration. And this time I have actually balanced off this equation. So how many of each kind of molecules do we need to do this reaction so that we have right mathematical numbers of each. So nothing just appears out of the blue, nothing just disappears to the blue, but each one of these, uh, these atoms, these elements that we're looking, carbon, hydrogens, oxygens, each one of them can be accounted and found on each side of this reaction. There are two processes that take place in cellular respiration that I do want to talk about. And these processes are oxidation and reduction. And you would need to know what each one of these stands for. So what each one of these is uh, doing. So let's start with oxidation. So oxidation in cellular respiration affects our sugar molecules, and as a result of oxidation, we are left with carbon dioxide. So oxidation refers to the removal of hydrogen atoms. And the hydrogen atoms then go into our water molecules that we end up producing as a byproduct of the, uh, of the oxidation of sugars. The other reaction is going to be reduction reaction. In reduction reaction, we instead add hydrogen atoms. So we have our oxygen molecules going into the cellular respiration reaction. And by adding the hydrogens, we are making from oxygens water molecules. Notice though that the, uh, we do need to have this equation balanced. And if you do the math, there is same number of each of the elements on both sides of the reaction. So those would be two that I would want you to know for the quiz oxidation, referring to the removal of hydrogen atoms and reduction referring to the addition of hydrogen atoms. And that, covers a lot of the cellular respiration. There's a couple of other branches to the story, if you wish to use that expression. And the first branch that I want to talk about is going to be talking about fermentation. 
in these reactions. So typically under normal conditions, you do need to have oxygen for the glucose to be turned into ATP. And if you have oxygen available, we get the maximum amount of ATP out of each glucose molecule. And that is actually 38 ATP molecules out of a single glucose molecule. But like I said, that requires that we have oxygen available. There are times when we don't have enough oxygen available. And we're going to talk about those times. What could cause it? Why would that be the case? In just a few moments. But we're going to first talk about what happens if we don't have enough oxygen available. We can still keep uh, converting glucose into ATP. However, if we don't have oxygen available, we are going to produce way less ATP for each glucose molecule. That's going to be only two ATP molecules per one glucose. We are doing this now in the absence of oxygen. So we talk about anaerobic glucose breakdown. So no oxygen present. So what we're seeing here is that when we don't have oxygen present and we still want to be converting glucose into ATP, that is not an efficient process. So as a result, the disadvantage is first of all that we make less ATP. The other significant disadvantage is that we are producing toxic products in this uh, process where we don't have oxygen available. So it's going to be toxic products that we end up building up within the cell. So when you keep, for example, you go to the gym and you keep exercising and exercising and exercising and your breathing goes up to keep up with the demand for more oxygen and you still keep going and your breathing can no longer keep up or you keep working out so hard that even if the breathing would keep up, your cardiovascular system, the blood is not getting around fast enough to provide enough oxygen to all of the cells. So in that stage, what you would think is that, oh, okay, then we can no longer continue. Well, it turns out that your body can go over its limits a little bit. And how it goes over these limits is in a process known as fermentation. So you keep going beyond the intake or distribution supply limits of oxygen to the body. The side uh, downside of this process was that you make less ATP and you end up with buildup of lactic acids. So if you've been exercising really hard or you've been on a long run afterwards, you get those lactic acids building up to the muscles and you need, might need time to recover from that. Your muscles feel achy sore the following day. That's because there's been toxic products produced within those muscles and we need to get rid of them. The benefit of this method is that first of all, fermentation is much faster than the traditional conversion of glucose molecules into ATP. So although it's not quite as efficient, we are able to make ATP, which your body so desperately needs while you're still exercising really fast. The other thing is that we can go beyond the limitations of how much you can breathe and how much oxygen can your cardiovascular system transport to all cells. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Fermentation allows us to still keep going beyond these limits, but as a trade-off, you make less ATP and you pay the price by buildup of toxic products as a result of this uh, process. We do use fermentation, of course, 
in many purposes, including production of certain food and drink materials. Uh, for example, production of alcohol relies on fermentation and also the production of carbon dioxide, those little bubbles in the alcohol drinks uh, also are a result of fermentation. There's many fermented food and the benefits of fermented food is a topic that's quite widely discussed. I'm going to leave that discussion for the lecture videos that you can go and check out in more detail and also to our nutritional classes in AMP2, so Bio 202 classes. One last part to this story about uh, cellular metabolism is that typically we discuss about a breakdown of carbohydrates, so sugars, and uh, in particular glucose as an example, how that gets converted into ATPs. But it's not only carbohydrates that we can convert into ATPs. Of course, we can use proteins and we can use lipids to uh, produce ATPs uh, to produce energy for your cells. So I just leave it to that and the full story you can again see in the full lecture videos. So now at this point we have covered the chapters uh, on photosynthesis and cellular respiration. What we have seen that photosynthesis required in addition to the solar energy also water and the convenient part of photosynthesis was that it allowed us to buy, bind some of that carbon dioxide. So if anyone says that they talk to their plants to make their plants grow better, that kind of makes sense because what they're essentially doing is that they're putting out carbon dioxide out of their breath to that plant and the plant is able to utilize that. So who knew talking to your plants might be uh, beneficial? As a result of the photosynthesis, of course, the big goal there was to produce sugars. The excellent byproduct for us, excellent news, is the production of oxygen. Cellular respiration, opposite to that, we take those sugars and oxygen and we make ATP. Uh, for the cells to utilize. Uh, we need to get rid of the carbon dioxide, the byproduct of cellular respiration. So that's why we need to transport that away from the cells to the lungs and then breathe out. So that covers the two chapters that I wanted to cover on this week. At this point, I'm just going to jump out of the PowerPoint and check whether anyone has any questions about anything that we have discussed so far. I know it was a lot of material and it was kind of jumping around, but uh, we had visited these teams, photosynthesis and cellular respiration before, even though we might not have discussed them in this amount of detail. So while I'm waiting for any questions, I'm going to brief you by telling that next we're going to go through this week's lab. And this week's lab uh, really looks at the processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. We're probably going to be focusing more on the cellular respiration. And um, the way we are approaching this lab in a traditional course is that we're actually going to measure breathing of a living organism. So how much that living organism is gonna need oxygen and how much carbon dioxide it's gonna put out. And by measuring the oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration that this living organism uses, we're able to tell about the rate of the cellular respiration that's going on. And when I first joined the college, I think that we were doing this lab by using, I want to say, um, we were using grasshoppers, I think. And using grasshoppers in a classroom, in a lab is a little tricky. They jump around everywhere. They're very fragile. Students didn't want to touch them. So they were shaking them from one flask to another. And they were really having a rough time. To, Poor, poor old grasshoppers surviving. So something better came along. 
If you've ever seen a cockroach, it's almost impossible to kill a cockroach. Uh, so I use cockroaches in this lab with my students and uh, I do keep cockroaches at my home for this reason, uh, since we are spending less time in the campus, less time in the lab, uh, I do keep my lab animals at home. So uh, that's a surprise that sometimes surprises people who uh, come and visit me and go to the garage there. They'll see that I have a farm of cockroaches there. So the reason why we keep cockroaches is that it allows us to study cellular respiration. So what cellular respiration is really is and I'm just trying to find my pointer. Oh my goodness, it just keeps jumping around. Bear with me. So, um, so cellular respiration tells us about conversion of the chemical energy, so the food, so our glucose, into ATP. And that was really the formula that we saw before for what happens in a cellular respiration. Converting sugars and oxygen into energy, ATP, and as a byproduct, producing carbon dioxide and uh, water. So one way how we can see if this is happening in an animal is by measuring how much carbon dioxide the animal is putting out and how much oxygen the animal is consuming. And this is done by all organisms such as bacteria, plants, animals. All of us do cellular respiration. Even though all of us cannot do photosynthesis, all of us do cellular respiration. So in this lab, we are studying the respiration of cockroaches by measuring their oxygen concentration and carbon dioxide output. And uh, the cockroaches that I keep are actually Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So these Madagascar hissing cockroaches would not be able to survive here in Arizona in nature. So I'm not too horribly worried about them escaping. They would just simply die. They're not going to be a threat to native species or anything like that. Although I have to say that I, they remain very well nicely enclosed where they need to be kept enclosed uh, in, in my home. In this lab, there's a lot of questions that I'm asking you to answer. And the questions might not be questions that you can answer just in a blink of an eye. Uh, they're not all multiple choice questions. There's questions where you need to produce your own answers. And a lot of the time what you'll end up noticing is that there's not clear right or wrong answers. So you might need to do a little research and even more so, you might need to do a little bit of thinking. So what I'm looking is not whether your answer is right or wrong. What I'm looking is that whether your answer is logical, whether you are able to explain to me how you came up with that answer. So we're looking for a logical reasoning process to support your scientific reasoning that led you to a particular answer. So that's what I'm asking in this lab. And I'm just going to jump to check. I think I heard a message coming through, but it was probably from somewhere else than this class. So that's, that's what I was jumping around. So the first question for this lab that I'm asking you to do is to formulate a hypothesis. So we've done hypothesis before, and we learned that a good hypothesis had few elements. It had an element if, and then to explain a concept. And um, the hypothesis that I'm asking you to tackle is that what do you think that would happen? Uh, what sort of an effect would temperature have on the rate of cellular respiration that these cockroaches do. So if we think that these cockroaches are in a room temperature or if they're in a cold environment, will they do more or less cellular respiration? And again, remember, you don't need to give me right answer. 
all you need to give me is a logical answer. You need to show some level of scientific reasoning process of how you come up with that answer. Uh, remember also when you're tackling this quiz is that it's not just a single question that I'm asking, even though I've tried to simplify it as a hypothesis. How do you think that the temperature will affect the rate of cellular respiration? You can an answer that question by tackling quite a few questions. What would be the control condition in this case? So what's the normal state of affairs? And if we really think about it, well, the normal would be the conditions where the cockroaches would normally be. So it would be the room temperature. Uh, what change do you expect to happen in the cellular respiration rate? And remember, we were measuring the cellular respiration by measuring oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration. What sort of a change do you expect to happen in cellular respiration rate when these cockroaches are in a cold condition? and when they're in a room condition, control condition. And I really want you to focus on this third bullet point. Explain your rationale. Why do you think that there will be more or less cellular respiration? Or why do you think that there might not be any effect on cellular respiration? I'm just not looking for if then answer, I'm actually looking for a little bit more than that. And you can earn extra credit on this question by adding a third condition, rather than just looking at the cold versus room temperature, also consider considering what would happen in warm conditions. Not boiling hot conditions, but warmer condition than room temperature. So that is the first question. And just to get you started, I'm going to propose one way to tackle this, but this is not the only way to tackle this. We can say, for example, if the temperature decreases from room temperature, so it gets colder, that might, and I'm just going to pick up an example out of the hat here, that it might mean that these cockroaches do less cellular respiration because they're trying to preserve their energy so cold now. Or it could be that when the temperature decreases, it gets colder from room temperature, these cockroaches do more cellular respiration because they're trying to move around to produce heat to remain warm or find another place where it's not that cold. They're trying to get away from that cold condition. So it really doesn't matter to me what you answer. What matters to me is a rational. So it's up to you in this lab that what you're going to answer. Uh, how we conduct this lab in a classroom is that we use something known as a biochamber. And you can see a biochamber on this slide uh, at the right bottom corner. It's basically a plastic container that holds enough air that the cockroaches that are put in there won't die. So they have enough air that they can go about their life and breathe and happily live. But this biochamber has openings that allow us to put measurement devices in there. And what we do, we measure the carbon dioxide concentration, we measure oxygen concentration, and we also measure the temperature within that biochamber. Professor? Yes. We don't see the PowerPoint. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Let's have a look what we can do. Let's see what we can do and what happened. So I'm going to try to share it again. And if one of you doesn't mind, just let me know if you can see it. And if you could just unmute yourself and let me know if you can see the PowerPoint. Anyone able to see the PowerPoint? 
Yeah. I Perfect. Can. Thank you. So I'm just quickly showing what we did went through. We went through about what the cellular respiration was. We saw the same formula, how we needed oxygen and we produced carbon dioxide uh, to produce ATP. We were looking at the oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration using the Madagascar cockroaches. I'm looking for reasoning. And then I had a bunch of questions for the hypothesis. Well, uh, next thing that we looked at was this biochamber that we saw and all the things that we can measure there. So basically what we do, we take a number of cockroaches and put them into this biochamber. They go about, live there happily, and um, they will end up breeding, doing cellular respiration. So they will end up consuming oxygen and putting out carbon dioxide. And we can tell that chains in that biochamber. Uh, we put that biochamber in different conditions. We measure it in room temperature, in uh, cold conditions. So we put that chamber into a dish where we have a lot of ice without any water actually getting into that chamber. We don't want to drown our cockroaches and in the third condition we put it under heat lamp and we collect data for a period of about 10 minutes after the cockroaches have had a chance to get used to the conditions and what we end up with is a kind of a linear representation of the data so what you'll see here on this graph is a bunch of dots so what we would do if we collect data over time, we end up collecting bunch of, and I'm just trying to get my pen to work, bunch of dots over time. So time is typically our x-axis. And what happens to the amount of carbon dioxide in the chamber? What happens to the amount of oxygen in the chamber? And what is the temperature? In so we get these results for each of these three measurements. And what we do, we fit in a line that kind of goes along where these dots would fall. And this line is known as a linear regression equation. So it's a method we use in science to make sense of the results that we get. And uh, we get some sort of a formula. And this formula tells us a lot about this line. So anyone who's been taking math classes, you will have seen that you can represent uh, a line in a coordinate by a formula where y equals something. And this formula typically has a few different elements. First of all, we measure the slope of the uh, of the uh, of the line that we're going to be. So high, how high, how steep or non-steep angle that, uh, that line has. And we also measure the rate of that, uh, that line, that reaction. And by these two measurements, or by all of these numbers, we're able to then reproduce this line in a coordinate uh, as, as needed. So really, what we would re uh, report and record in a lab from a lab where we look at uh, the effects of different conditions on the breeding of cockroaches would be the slope and the rate uh, those would be the two numbers that we want to record as an output of this linear regression equation. And what you see here is probably a little bit better, better representation of the biochamber. So you see that on this chamber uh, we have these measuring devices and uh, of course, when we move from one condition to another, we open the chamber, we let the air change, and we let the cockroaches to get adjusted to the new conditions. The two conditions that I told you that we're looking at uh, and I'm asking you to address on your hypothesis is the room temperature and ice bath. And what you can see at the background that they're getting some sort of a craft where 
these values either go up and or down. And what we typically end up finding that oxygen and carbon dioxide are in are related to each other. So as the amount of oxygen goes down, typically the amount of carbon dioxide would go up or the other way around. So they are related in cellular respiration. So the second question on the lab will ask you to analyze a little bit of this um, gra linear regression graph that we produced. So I'm asking you to complete this sentence. In a linear regression analysis, we produce a formula where y equals m times x plus b. And I'm asking you what the m and what the x would be. And this is the way we're going to take the attendance for the second time for this class. So if you don't mind just posting your answers uh, out of the multiple choice options that I provided there. And I see that many of you answered correctly. So it is the M symbolizes the slope, the X symbolizes the rate of the reaction. So if you pick that, you've gotten it. You're clearly on the right track. The third question on this lab asks that what does the Y stand for in this uh, equation? And I know that the linear regression equation that I have listed there on the screen is kind of a tiny, but if you look really, really closely, what you will end up seeing is that the Y stands for the predicted values of the Y. So if you got that, you were doing a great job. Uh, before we wrap up this review of the lab, we should look at the results a little bit. And this is what's interesting about science, what's interesting about teaching labs, that sometimes the results that we get, there's a lot of variation. And I never want you to feel that you have to get the right results in a science lab. No, the results that you get are the results you get and you go with it. Uh, what we do, we do, first of all, visual observation of the behavior of the cockroaches. So we simply look how active they are, and we might come up with some sort of a numeric way of grading it from one with little activity to, let's say, three or five of a lot of activity zero, no activity, they would be dead or dormant. So one thing that we notice when we just visually observe the cockroaches is that some groups report that as we put the cockroaches into the cold condition, they go dormant. They just become very still, non-active. They're not dead, they're still breeding, they're still alive, but they're not doing a lot of things because it's cold. Other groups sometimes come back and report that these cockroaches become really highly active, much more active than they are in a room temperature because they're really trying to get away from that cold. So the results vary. There's a little bit of variation there. But it's not just the visual observation that we do. We also record these carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. And that gives us a little bit more information, a little bit more of a, a quant uh, quantitative result, something numeric that we can report. And that brings us to the question four in your lab. I'm asking you to tell me, what evidence do we have in this lab about the fact that cockroaches undergo cellular respiration. How do we know that these cockroaches are breathing, that their cells are consuming sugars producing ATP, consuming oxygen producing carbon dioxide? Well, the way how we do that is just what we were recording. So by recording the amounts of carbon dioxide and oxygen, we are able to tell what's happening with the cellular respiration. So I'm letting you to phrase your own answer, but really it's a simple question. I'm just simply wanting to see that you realize that all these measurements that we were doing for the carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels we're there so that we can figure out based on that cellular respiration formula 
that how much cellular respiration they are doing. So if they are doing a lot of cellular respiration, they're going to be consuming a lot of carbon dioxide and they're going to be producing a lot of oxygen. If they are doing very little cellular respiration, very little carbon dioxide will be produced, very little oxygen will be consumed. So the final question that I have on this lab is a question that will require a little bit of independent research, maybe going back to the topics that we have talked about earlier on. So there's not a direct answer that I have provided for you. But what I'm asking you to is consider not just cellular respiration, but chemical reactions in general. So we have talked a lot in this class or in this course about chemistry and chemical reactions. And now I'm asking you to reflect back on all of that. What sort of an effect temperature had on the chemical reactions? So what effect temperature has on the rate of chemical reactions in general? And how about when it relates to the cockroaches of this lab? Is there an upper or lower limit to the temperatures when it comes to our cockroaches? And for anyone who's present on this review session, I will help you to get started on this question. One of the things that we remember that as we raised temperature in general, chemical reactions became quicker and quicker and quicker. That's why increase in temperature tended to speed up the rate of chemical reactions. Well, do we see that in the cockroaches or not? That depends on whatever you believe. As long as you have a rational behind of, we, of what you believe, I'll be happy with your answer. And of course, there is going to be upper and lower limit. We don't want to freeze our cockroaches to death. If they're dead, there's not going to be any chemical reactions taking place. We also don't want to boil them or cook them in an oven. If they're dead, there's not going to be any chemical reactions taking place. So those answers should help you to tackle with this question. Remember, our labs are worth of quite a few points, so I am looking for more than just a simple sentence. I'm not looking for a full essay, but about a paragraph would be a good amount of an answer to a question on the lab report. And that really brings me to the end of everything that I wanted to go through today. Uh, I know it's been a lot of information. I appreciate you sticking around. Uh, if you don't have any questions, this is it for today. If you have any questions, I will be around. And one last thing that I'm going to ask you to do before you jump off is again to post your name on the chat. I will take the attendance from there. And like I've shared with you in the past, uh, the attendance will in a roundabout way count as extra credit to your final scores in the exams. I will add a column to the grade record where you get the extra points. Uh, if you don't have any questions, if you're happy with this session, what, what you got out of it, that's it for today. If you have any questions, uh, stick around, let me know, and I will definitely try my best to answer those. Uh, I hope you have a very good rest of the night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Hey, Professor. Yes. Hey, I was I'm wondering, wondering if you could. Oh, sorry, I was wondering if you could go back when um, you were off the PowerPoint. Absolutely. Let's have a look. So I believe it was right at the beginning of the cockroach lab. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Are you still seeing the screen? Yeah, I still see the screen. There's Perfect. Let's go through it just quickly. Uh, I just want me to make sure that you get all the information. I appreciate that you guys let me know. So what I 
which started the discussion of the lab, who was just discussing what the cellular respiration tells us. And cellular respiration was, of course, this formula that we had seen before. And cellular respiration tells us that if we are converting chemical energy, so basically any food that we get, into ATP, so this energy format that yourself could use. And um, the way we were able to get this information out of the, whether cellular respiration is happening or not, out of what we were measuring, was by measuring the amount of oxygen and amount of carbon dioxide in that biochain. And we will end up seeing that the cellular respiration, we will see that in all living organisms, it wouldn't have to be just animals. It could be that we put plants into that biochamber. Of course, plants are going to change things around a little bit because they also do photosynthesis in addition to cellular respiration. So uh, that's what I wanted to tell first. The second thing that I wanted to talk about was that we're using Madagascar hissing cockroaches as a model organism for studying uh, their breeding. And I really just mentioned that we are measuring the uh, oxygen consumption, carbon dioxide production, and there's rarely going to be right or wrong answers. So whatever you answer in this lab, I'm not so focused on whether it's completely agreeing with what would happen in a face-to-face -face lab. I'm looking whether your answer makes sense whether you are able to show that you're capable of doing scientific reasoning, you are explaining how you come up with your conclusion. Then I think that I introduced you to the hypothesis question. So uh, first thing that I ask you to do in the lab is to speculate what the temperature would do, how it would affect the rate of the cellular respiration, so how much cellular respiration is happening. And we have two different conditions. We have the room temperature condition, which was our control condition. Then we have the cold condition when we put the biochamber in a bucket of ice so that the environment mm -hmm. around the cockroaches gets cold. We don't want to drown the, any of the cockroaches, so we make sure that water doesn't get into the biochamber. And the third condition was what if it gets warmer than room temperature. So we would put, in this case, the cockroaches under a heat lamp. So these were our three conditions. You only need to address two of them, the room temperature and cold temperature. If you address the third condition, that's just extra credit points. So I'm asking you to speculate on the hypothesis. What would happen to the cellular respiration rate? And you would need to give me some sort of a rational. If you just tell me that I think that this will happen, it, you will get some points, but you will not get full points on this lab. So one way to approach it would be, for example, by saying that if the temperature decreases, so by that I mean that it gets colder, then I think that the cockroaches will do less cellular respiration because they're trying to conserve their energy for staying alive. Uh, other answer could be that, well, I actually think that if the temperature decreases so it gets colder, I think they will do more cellular respiration because they're really trying to be active so that they produce heat as they move around or they're trying to get away from the cold. They're walking around in the biochamber trying to find a warmer place. So really what you answer doesn't matter, that you provide me some sort of a logical reasoning for what you answer is what matters. And then I think that at this slide, we were kind of picking up that uh, this uh, slides hadn't yeah. came up. So basically mm -hmm. from here on, I think that we talked about it. Does that clarify it at all? Yeah, it does. I just am just coming up with more questions. You can so, ask any questions. I'll be more than happy to answer. I know, but I just, uh, okay. I just feel like it's something that I probably have to research, but I was thinking of like, as crazy as it sounds, I was thinking of male or female. I was thinking of age of the cockroaches. Like why would these act like a certain way with the temperature change and why, you know, 
like how you were you're mentioning make how... that's a good scientist i'm telling you that all of those are brilliant questions so i think that you're <laughs> even able to go beyond what i'm asking in this lab i would strongly <laughs> encourage that please add those questions to your lab report it doesn't matter where okay. you put them because I will definitely give extra credit. It shows me that you're thinking in a very scientific, following the scientific method. You're considering all of the variables. And I'm going to be honest, and this is not to put any diss on any other students, oh, but no, I, think no. you're thinking, I think you're thinking more than most students would. And that's excellent. That's always going to earn you extra points. And I'm going to be honest, those all would affect males and females differ in terms of their biology uh, so it could be that male and female cockroaches could differ in terms of their biology we know that male cockroaches are much more aggressive in their behavior they're fighting with mm -hmm. other males we also know that age definitely could play a role just that with the age comes the physical size difference as well so all mm -hmm. of those are so valid points and I'm going to be honest, that's why I think that when we run this lab in a lab, a face to face lab with students, we get so varied results. Now, I have another question with females. If they're carrying eggs, that's a different story, too, right? That would be. And actually, what's interesting about the cockroaches uh, is I don't know how familiar you are. Some people keep them as pets. Uh, I don't do it because I love them as pets. I just do it no. because I need them for my job. But what cockroaches do, they don't really lay eggs. They instead okay. of lay this kind of a tube where they have the babies. So the, it's something okay. in between of having an egg and giving a life birth. It's kind of a weird middle ground. Uh, it's rare to get to see that, but I normally try when I have face-to-face -face classes to bring that for my students if, I, if any of them is about to uh, uh, give birth. So what we notice with that is that, of course, at that stage, the female cockroach is just interested of getting those babies out. That is going to be their priority. So that makes perfect sense of what you're asking. Uh, I would also dare to argue that it's going to burn a lot of their resources. Giving birth mm -hmm. is really expensive. Uh, one of the things that I discuss with my students in this lab is that males have it easy in a biological sense. Males give a very little contribution to the production of offspring. They just are around for a moment and then they're gone. But females instead have to invest a lot more energy to the reproduction. So that's why in most species, it is the females who do the choice of the mate that they choose. And then we go into whole discussion about the uh, male cockroaches competing for females and so on and so on. So definitely that would have a role. So you're totally thinking like a pure scientist. Okay. Is there anything else that you're thinking, anything that I can help with? I'm going to be honest. You've totally blown my mind that you are thinking of these questions. These are amazing. I'm very, very impressed. I'm very proud to have you in my class. Oh, thanks. No, I just, I'm, I'm such an overthinker and I just think, you know, I overthink things, you know, and, um, and but that's it, a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> It might not feel good now, but keep in mind that uh, as you move through your studies, when you get through the basic things, really asking those questions is what's going to get you further in scientific research in all of those processes. So uh, you're doing it already. So I'm going to be honest, you're going to go to places. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay. Oh, and thank is you for changing. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for changing the date on the quiz. Absolutely. And if anything like that ever happens, please let me know because I'm not here to make anyone's life like a stress. Uh, I, all I care is that you learn 
And if you need a little longer, and I think that this was totally justified, I think you were the only one who was asking it aloud, whereas everyone else in the class was thinking of it. Uh, if it yeah. helps, I'm totally happy to do. And please know that I so see the hard work that you're putting into this class. And uh, mm -hmm. I can't promise what grade you get just yet, because we still have the oh, yeah. assessment elements. But I do know where you're standing now and you're doing really, really well. So keep doing those. Unfortunately, I can't give like double A or triple A for extra good uh, students, okay. but you are there. <laughs> you are there. Okay, okay perfect. Um, okay, so I'll let you go because I know you have to get to another class. Of course, but do know that I'm always happy to take the time. I so appreciate you and never hesitate to reach out to me. I know that I'm kind of, there's a lot going on at the moment uh, with some of the other duties that I picked up, but I will always get back to you and I really appreciate your work and I hope you have a very good rest of the night. Okay, I also messaged you um, because I was watching the slide and it also you also mentioned about a handout of, um, was that just in okay. a classroom setting? I probably have mentioned a handout that I've used in a classroom setting. I'm going to go through those videos and have a look what handout I'm referring to, and I will upload it on the Blackboard. I think I have okay, an idea of what handout it is. So I will make an announcement of that. Uh, if I haven't made it by the end of tomorrow, then please uh -huh. do not hesitate to let me know and uh, remind me. Uh, but I will try to do it uh, by the end of tomorrow to have the same handout available. Uh, I really think that the handout is just a picture of a plant and picture of an animal and those formulas of photosynthesis oh. and cellular respiration. But I absolutely want to add that to the material. So thank you for picking that. It's been a journey for us as well, jumping from face-to-face -face classes to online settings. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. And on that note, I'm just going to stop recording at this point, and uh, I will make this a recording available on your uh, Blackboard in due course.